Good morning, everybody. We give you a very warm welcome to our online service for Kenmuir Mount Vernon and Carmyle Churches. We pray that God will bless you today as you worship with us. The sermon is a recording from a previous service at Carmyle Church. We open with some words from Romans. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our opening hymn is Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like thee his praise should sing? Let us pray. Our Father, we rejoice in you today, our living Lord, our Saviour. We thank you that Jesus Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, before we were converted. Long ago, he took our pain, our sorrows and our sins as he suffered for us. We want to praise you, our Father and God, that we have been set free. We have been justified and forgiven. We have been sanctified and cleansed. And above all, we have been made your dear children. Father, we thank you that we can come to you today and give you praise and thanks for all your goodness to us. We pray for your Holy Spirit to help us worship you today, to give you the praise due to your name, for your great love, and the great salvation you have purchased for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our reading today is Psalm 46. Psalm 46, and we'll be reading all of it. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this reading of his own most holy word. We will continue our service with the hymn, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. And the chorus, you alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you.
Let us pray. Our Father, we want to thank you that Psalm 46 shows us that we can always put our trust in you, no matter how bad the situation. The psalmist considers mountains crumbling and falling into the sea, causing a great tsunami all over the planet. He says, even then, we do not need to be afraid, because you are our refuge and strength, and you are always there to help us. Father, we thank you that in spite of the war in Ukraine, the threat of COVID, increased fuel and energy prices, worldwide food shortages, we still confidently put our trust in you, relying on your great faithfulness. Father, help us to be still in your presence and to know that you are the God who is in control of all things. We thank you that you are close to each one of us, only a breath away. But Lord, we often spend our time on other things. We pray that you will forgive us, Lord. Help us to come to you and know the comfort, the strength, the blessing, the intimacy of being still before you. We pray for the situation in the Ukraine. This war has been raging for over three months and does not seem to be coming to an end. We continue to pray that you will bring this war to a close and foil the ambitions of the aggressor. Our hearts go out to the Ukraine people whose way of life has been destroyed, living in fear, grieving the loss of loved ones and seeing buildings destroyed. We pray for all the people of Ukraine, including those who have fled and found refuge in another country, that you will draw near to them, to strengthen and protect them, causing them to seek your face and find solace in the peace of Christ. We bring before you the people who live in our parishes of Kenmuir and Carmyle. We pray for families, husbands, wives and children, that there will be harmony in their homes and that there may be places of peace, enjoyment and safety. We pray for all the activities in our parishes, for a community spirit of helpfulness to each other. We pray for those in need. We think of those who are ill, perhaps in hospital, those suffering from COVID, those awaiting a hospital operation or something else. We pray that you will be with them, granting your help, peace and healing. We pray for the bereaved, that you will comfort and strengthen them with the peace of Christ. Finally, Father, we pray for ourselves that you will bless us in this coming week. Help us to walk closely with you, showing love and kindness to all we meet. And may we be a blessing to our friends and family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, on the 24th of February this year, Russia invaded Ukraine. The world was filled with horror as one European country invaded another. Russia had already uh, invaded Ukraine and Crimea eight years previously, and we had seen the build-up of Russian troops on the border since late 2021 but no one expected it to happen. It had happened before, of course, the Soviet Union had took over Hungary in 1956 and Czechoslovakia in 1968. But you have to go back further to find someone invading another land like was happening before our eyes. And that was when Hitler invaded Poland in 1939. Can you imagine what it was like you wake up one morning and you find that bombs being dropped around you. And it's not just military targets, civilians and hospitals have been targeted as well. And over three million people have left the country seeking sanctuary uh, elsewhere, elsewhere. But it's affected us. In, in the UK, we have been horrified to what we see. 
In fact, the DEC, the Disasters Emergency uh, Committee, which had been set up representing about 15 charities, has received a staggering £200 million to help these people and to provide them with housing. That's, uh, uh, of all the um, sort of catastrophes in the world, this has outstripped them by a huge amount. And the question I want to ask this morning is where is God in all this? And so what I want to do is to look and answer this question by looking at Psalm 46. The background to this psalm could well be the threat of the Assyrian army under Sennacherib, uh, which was the most powerful army in the world at that time. This army had invaded many, many nations and successfully overcome them. It's very much a situation that we have at the moment between Russia and uh, the Ukraine. And now they have, they have approached uh, Jerusalem and uh, they're, they're on the verge of taking over the city and they've arrived, they can be seen from the walls of Jerusalem and in a sense uh, it's a no-brainer who's going to win in this battle. So let's look at what our uh, psalm says. It says these words, it opens with these wonderful words, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. This psalmist makes this astounding statement that in all our troubles, wherever we are, whatever we're going through, God is there. He is ever-present with us. And the reason he's with us, according to this verse, is because he wants to help us. And we need to understand this, that God is by our side and is there for us to call upon him with any situation we have. And that's why we pray. We pray because we know that God is with us and he hears and answers prayer. He is our refuge. He is the one that protects us through our lives. And the idea of a refuge is, is, is something like a fortress which you can take refuge inside, if you like, or a walled city or a strong tower. That's what it would be like physically. But God protects us from all sorts of things that come our way. And many of them we are not aware of. I remember as a young Christian uh, that uh, someone said to me uh, that God had protected me from all sorts of things and, I, and he didn't even tell me about it. And that's what's happening in our lives, that God is protecting us all the time. And uh, it's a wonderful and a wonderful uh, truth that he is there. He is our refuge. He is your refuge. Secondly, he is our strength. He gives us strength. He gives us fortitude. He gives us the ability to go through our difficulties and even with uh, rejoicing. And these pictures of God in our refuge and strength is abundant throughout the scriptures, particularly in the book of Psalms. And because of this, we never need to be afraid. We do not need to be afraid. The phrase, uh, fear not or do not be afraid, occurs 366 times in the scripture. God says that to you this morning. You don't need to be afraid of anything. And the psalmist knew this. And to prove his point, he makes this ridiculous statement. He says this, imagine a huge earthquake occurs on earth that causes all the mountains to tumble down and to go into the sea and to form a, a gigantic tidal wave that just sweeps across all the countries. He says, imagine that. <laughs> uh, and uh, he says, but we won't fear even if that happens to us. That's what the psalmist is saying, no matter how big the problem, uh, that is what we can do. 
And occasionally that's happened when Krakatoa, the island in the Pacific, blew up because of a, of a, a volcano. It sent a tidal wave which went around the earth three times. And so God is saying through the psalmist, you do not need to be afraid for God is our refuge, he is our strength, and he is an ever-present help in times of trouble. The psalm divides into three sections. After sections two and three, and maybe also after section one uh, as well, in, in the original, when it's originally written, but not, not at the moment, we have this refrain. And this is what it says. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So the Lord Almighty is with us and is always there for us. And it mentions the name, the God of Jacob. In other words, we can use Jacob as an illustration of what is being meant here. Now, Jacob occurs in the book of Genesis, and it, it's from uh, chapters 25 right through to 50. Half the book of Genesis is about Jacob. And if you look at his life, what do you find? It's a catalogue of crises and drama full of ups and downs. There is deceptions. Jacob deceived his brother Esau after his birthright. And, it's, and then he went to stay with his uncle Laban. His uncle Laban deceived him several times. There was rebellion amongst the, the sons. And in fact, Joseph himself was disliked so much he was sold into slavery in Egypt. And then the, uh, dis, uh, the brothers brought news of his death back to his father. And the father didn't know that he was in Egypt. They told him he died and been killed by a wild animal. And the tremendous heartache that was in J Jacob's heart because of that. And he didn't know that Joseph were alive for years and years uh, afterwards. He was his favourite son. He should have had a favourite son, of course. That's caused some of the problems. And in his family, there are all these... The brother wives which he had and himself, there's all these battles going on. It's a bit like the roaring of foaming and the mountains falling into the sea. His life was that sort of life. And yet in the end, the whole family, including Joseph, ends up living in style in Egypt, the richest country in the world, and they went into the best part called Goshen. And there, 66 of them, with their, counting their sons and grandchildren uh, and everything, uh, they went, went down there as a, just 60 to 70 people. And from that grew a nation, the nation of Israel. At the end of this life, Jacob said, gave glory to God, he says these words, God has been my shepherd all my life. God had looked after him as a shepherd cares for sheep. So Jacob found that God looked after him, and he does for us as well. So the Lord Almighty is indeed with us, and the God of Jacob is our God too. In the second section, uh, we read of how God saved Israel from the greatest army in history to date, and that was the Assyrian army, which had arrived at Jerusalem in the reign of Hezekiah. Jerusalem was the capital, of course, but it was far more than the capital. It was the city where God dwelt. God dwelt in uh, Jerusalem. He dwelt in the temple. God Most High dwelt amongst them. And that's why the whole nation of Israel went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times every year to worship God. It was a delightful city in which a river brought much needed water uh, so that they had all the water they uh, needed to have. We need to understand that Israel and the Middle East and all of that part of the world is desert. And desert is a dreadful place. It's arid, nothing grows there. It's a fearsome place to live in. But you put a river through the desert, as you have in Egypt, the Nile, and it changes everything. The water can be channeled to grow crops and to sustain life. 
And the nation of Israel, sorry, the nation of is uh, Egypt was all along the banks of the river uh, Nile in those days. The desert in scripture is a picture of a person who has chosen to live without God. It's arid, it's fruitless. Yes, they may have joys and things and, and uh, insist on uh, satisfying their bucket list or whatever they want to do, but they're without God, it's like a desert. But the river represents the life that God brings into us, our lives as we uh, receive him. In heaven there is a river, it's called the water of life, it flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb, that is Jesus, and it's there for everyone. And it makes heaven, heaven. And right at the very end of Revelation chapter 22, it encourages us, all those who are thirsty, to come to God. Being thirsty doesn't mean thirsty for water, it means thirsty for God uh, to come and to freely take of this water of life. So the river is a picture of the joys of heaven. So what does Hezekiah, the king of Israel, do when he sees this vast army of Assyrians near his city? What does he do? He prays. That's what he does, he prays. And this is what he says, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand. That's Sennacherib's hand. So that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord, are the only God. He prays to God. And they get up the following morning, and they go and stand on the wall, and they look over the wall, and what do they see? No army. So they go out to investigate, and they find 180,000 dead bodies. We don't know what happened, but obviously God intervened. And Sennacherib went back to Nineveh, defeated. The most powerful nation on earth at that time. And we can apply this to this situation here. Russia is an incredibly powerful nation, but we can trust God in this situation. Verse 5 says, God is within her, that is, Jerusalem. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. That's what it said, and that's exactly what happened. It was at break of day, before dawn, that this had taken place after Hezekiah had prayed. In the New Testament, uh, the physical city of Jerusalem is changed. It's replaced by the heavenly Jerusalem. There's a Jerusalem in heaven, and this is the true Jer Jerusalem. And the heavenly Jerusalem is the church, Christ's bride. It's us, the people of God. We are the heavenly Jerusalem. And it's to us today that he says that God is our refuge and strength and will help us in all our struggles. And it says to us today that God is in control of the nations. In fact, it goes on further and it says, he lifts his voice and even the earth melts. It's by the voice of God that he created the heavens and the earth. God spoke and it was so. And in the same way, he can use his voice to absolutely destroy everything. And there is to be a new heaven and a new earth. So what's the well, anyhow, never mind, I won't go into that today. But this refrain uh, comes again a second time. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And then we turn to section three. In here, the uh, psalmist sums up the situation. He says this, come and see what the Lord has done. This battle with uh, Sennacherib was just one of many battles that Israel had to face over the years. One notable one is the drowning of Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. You remember that a story. 
And it talks about the desolations he has brought on earth. But how is this to be achieved today? What is our great weapon today? Is it tanks? Is it arms? What is it? Our greatest weapon is love. You think of love as something gentle and love it kind and cheerful and all these things. How can that do anything? But it can. This is what Malcolm, uh, Michael Wilcox says uh, in, in his commentary on this psalm. He says, All over the world, people of goodwill, with little power and few resources, pick away at the edges of evil, while others with enormous wealth and influence will not or do not do anything about it. It's the little people doing the little things that mounts up and changes things. And we know that God does change things in many wonderful ways. So ultimately God makes wars to seek completely from the ends of the earth. He will break the bow. He will shatter the spear. He will burn the shields with fire. It will all be done away with. There will be no war museum in uh, heaven. And God will be exalted in the nations. In fact, God will be exalted in the entire earth. And this is looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Just as certainly as he came to Bethlehem long ago, yet he is coming again. And when he comes again, we will be with him as he comes back to earth. Because we will be uh, caught up in the air, or, or if we've died, we'll be with him that way. But either way, we'll be coming on earth with him. And on that day, all evil will be completely crushed. And this is one of the great events that's still to come in history. And so, God says to the nations, get wise, get real about the situation. The reality is that God will be exalted over the entire globe. What the nations need to do is to be still. To be still and to know that I am God. What they need to do is to acknowledge that God is in control, that it's his world. And as nations do that, then they will experience the blessing of God. Now, a lot of the blessings of the West is because in times past, there have been nations that's followed the Lord. Certainly it's true of the UK, and it's certainly true of the United States. There's been a godliness about these nations, but alas, the West at the moment seems to be withdrawing from all those things. Over Christmas, Janet and I watched a film called Tea with Mussolini. It caught my eye, I thought, that's an interesting title for a film. And it starred Judy Dench and Maggie Smith, so I thought, oh, well, that's enough for me. <laughs> and so we watched it. And it was about some British women who had chosen to live in Italy and they're enjoying the good life of Italy, but then World War II came along. And at the beginning it was okay. But, uh, and in fact, uh, at the beginning they, had, they in fact did have tea with Mussolini and talked to him about that. But shortly after that he allied himself uh, with the Germans. By 1943, things were starting to get very difficult for these women. In fact, they were in real danger. And I remember, as I was watching it at this stage uh, on the TV, I knew something about the history of Italy during uh, World War II. And I knew this, that in a year's time from there, Mussolini will be dead. And in two years from there, Hitler will be dead. Dictators do not last forever. And we can put the situation that we have in, in, in our world today, in this terrible war, into God's hands and look to him. But this verse is not only spoke to nations, we often take it, we apply it to ourselves, and that is right and proper. It's good for us to be still in the presence of God, to come into his presence and to be still and to know that he is God. 
And as we do this, our confidence will rise. Our security will rise. Our comfort will grow as we draw near to him. Last week I shared with you that Jesus is gentle and lowly in heart. That Jesus said to us, come to, come to me and take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And if we do that, we'll find rest for our souls, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. This coming to Jesus, to be still before him, is a wonderful thing. I would encourage you to take time out every single day to draw near to God, to draw near to Jesus, and allow him to transform you, to be still with him. You could use some music, you can read the scriptures, you can do all sorts of things. But I just sit in a chair and I put my hands out, close my eyes, and I just know that he's there because of his great promises. And often I feel his presence, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And you can know this, you're Christian people, it's for you as well. Previously, I looked at Jesus as the lover of our souls. And what Jesus is calling us to is to have an intimate, satisfying relationship with Jesus. And you can have that too. It's for all of us. The, the great truth of Christianity is this. It's to know God. It's the most wonderful person in the universe. And to know his son, Jesus Christ, as our friend and our saviour who is always there for us. That when we mess up, he comes towards us, he doesn't run away. He's always ever present with us. Let's learn how to be still in his presence. Let's learn how to perceive that, that he is God Almighty. So, the first verse of the psalm is this. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Shall we just pray? Oh, our Father, we bless you. Oh, our Father, we praise you that you are Lord of all. We thank you that you will be exalted in the nations. You'll be exalted on the earth. We praise you, Lord, that although we don't see that at the moment, yet this is the programme that you're working towards when Jesus Christ will come again. But we thank you, Father, that in our individual lives, in our walk with you, we can know peace. We can know the security of your love. We can know that, that you are indeed our refuge, the one who protects us, that you are the one that's with us to strengthen us, to give the ability to go through all the difficulties of life, just trusting in you, knowing that you will work out these things. And so, Father, we come to you today and we ask that you will bless us and that you will encourage us and strengthen us by your Holy Spirit. Help us to commit ourselves into your hands. Help us to spend time with you every day, drawing near to you, being still, enjoying your presence because we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. We will close with a hymn. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you.